Uh, our first presentation is a continuation of the dialogue we've been having about the role of technology in the future economy, which includes how we'll, we will invest. Ted Eliopoulos, our Chief Investment Officer, will moderate the discussion. And Ted, I'll leave it to you to introduce our panelists. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. If I could ask uh, uh, our panelists to, to make their way up, uh, up to the front. Larry, I see. Laura. James. We'll give them some time to make their way up to, uh, up to the front table here. Uh, Madam President, as you, uh, as you introduced, uh, this panel discussion uh, today is really a continuation of the expert uh, panel discussions that uh, we have shared together, uh, starting at the July 2017 offsite in Monterey, and also at our January 2018 offsite in Petaluma. Uh, today, uh, we combine, uh, as we have in the past, some video presentations uh, to uh, intersperse with these three excellent panelists uh, joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, Larry Sonsini, well known uh, to the Investment Committee and our board, uh, will, will lead the discussion today. In our first 90 minutes, uh, we're going to focus really on the context and implications of technology, innovation, uh, and disruption uh, that, uh, that will impact uh, the innovation direct investment vehicle that we've uh, discussed together. Uh, including, as uh, most specifically requested by uh, our controller, uh, Ms. Yi, uh, a thoughtful consideration of the jobs impact of some of these technology innovations that we see coming. Following this uh, first segment, uh, we will then turn our attention to, the, to some issues that will pertain, pertain to the long-term direct investment vehicle we've been discussing, uh, focusing more specifically as, as Marcy underscored in her remarks, on the core economy and uh, the imperative for traditional um, uh, investing sectors to really adapt to what we see, we all see as a rapidly changing environment and world. Uh, as usual, we invite a interactive and lively uh, exchange of ideas and thoughts uh, with the board here today. And so uh, giving plenty of time for the team to, uh, uh, to come together and, and join us, I'm going to turn uh, this over to Larry Sonsini, who will then make uh, you know, more formal introductions of our panelists. Larry, thank you for being here. Thanks, Ted. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody. It's great to be before you again. Um, I'm very pleased to have uh, two wonderful people joining me. Uh, to my immediate left is Laura Tyson, Many of you know of Laura. She is currently uh, the interim dean of the business school at Berkeley, Hawes. Uh, she was a former dean uh, there, I remember very well. She's also a former dean of the London Business School. And of course, uh, Laura is well known as a distinguished economist. Uh, she is a member of the US Department of State Foreign Affairs Policy Board. She's a member of, uh, of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness and uh, President Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. Uh, you'll recall that she served in President Clinton's administration as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and as a director of, of the National Economic Council. She's also a member uh, of the board of directors of some distinguished large public companies, including AT&T. So it's absolutely wonderful to see uh, Laura here and to be with her again. And to Laura's left, we have uh, Jimmy Nowicki, James Nowicki. Um, Jimmy is an associate partner at McKinsey & Company. Um, he is a leader in that organization uh, in the area of digital and innovation for capital projects and for infrastructure practices. So he spends a lot of time supporting clients and projects across the natural resources, um, infrastructure, which we'll be talking about, and very importantly, in technology sectors, basically to focus on improvements in cost, scheduling, and performance. Um, prior to joining McKinsey, Jimmy uh, had roles uh, with some companies uh, 
Constellation Energy, Quantum Energy Partners, and he was with Goldman Sachs, I believe. So it's great to have Jimmy here. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is have a, uh, an interactive discussion with you about uh, the disruption uh, that is being caused by technology. Uh, we'll focus on its impact primarily in investing, but actually other parts of society which are integrated in with investing. And uh, before we begin, uh, let me just try to set the stage. Some of this is somewhat redundant for some of you, but I think it puts in context how we are going to look at this. So suffice it to say, uh, we are living in a digital, personal, virtual world. It's digital in the sense that all physical content, um, every physical process, all analog content will become digitized. Uh, it's a, a virtual world because technology is making time and space and geography somewhat irrelevant. And it's a personal world because it's putting in our hands individually more control of time and space and content. And of course, it's a mobile world. Um, and all of this is largely due to all of the elements of the internet penetration. And I think it's, it's important to kind of put that in perspective. Uh, in the United States, uh, it is said that we have over 290 million users of the internet. Uh, close to 90% of the population. It is said that we have 225 million users of the smartphone, about 70% of the population, and 235 million users of the mobile internet. And of course, we are not alone as a nation. <clears throat> we know uh, that China is expending enormous effort on technology and technology disruption. Uh, globally that impacts uh, our communities, uh, our environment, our jobs, and our investing. And yet China's internet penetration is only about 50 percent, but its scale is huge. Uh, they have three times the number of smartphone users we do. They have 11 times the number of mobile payment users. So technology has become a very important part of that government's agenda. And both nations, as well as others, through all of this technology, are digitizing almost every industry. Uh, shopping, payments, video, music, messaging, social media, ride sharing, home sharing, travel, even dating, and of course, education. And we've discussed disruption of industries, and we've seen how unique it is. Um, isn't it interesting that the largest taxi services in the world own no cars? That the largest hotelers own no real estate? That the largest real estate uh, realtors uh, and retailers uh, own no inventory? And of course, the search technology has made knowledge ubiquitous. And knowledge used to be power, but now it's in the hands of many. So things are changing in how we relate. And as a result, we are seeing the exponential growth of large disruptive technology companies plus new disruptive technology innovation. Those are the two things that we see that are driving a lot of this based on this technology. Of course, in the United States, you know of those companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, Microsoft. But it is also true in China. Uh, there are two giant technology companies in China, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. Uh, the combined revenues of those companies are approaching $100 billion in U.S. currency. And these companies, both in the U.S. and in China, are investors. They're investing in these companies and in technology. As a matter of fact, I just learned that the three dominant Chinese technology companies control 50% of the 125 so-called unicorn technology companies in China. And those are private companies valued at over a billion US dollars. 
50% of them are controlled by those enterprises. So we see investing during this age of disruption from many, many different sources. And I think that we have to realize that this disruptive technology is not only creating these great enterprises, it is also displacing and reshaping industries with a major impact on our social contract and, of course, job creation, something that we're going to be talking a little bit about because it affects how we look at investing, but also how we adjust to these trends. These disruptive technologies are constantly challenging business models. They're constantly challenging uh, and innovating, at the same time, traditional models. One investor has said that as investors, we need to understand all of this disruption, but we also have to understand the threats to our incumbent industries and our incumbent uh, institutions and balance that too. And I think that is some of the challenge that we face in, in that balancing. Uh, lastly, I, I, I think it's important uh, that we appreciate that uh, this disruption is, is not going to slow down. Uh, it, it is going to accelerate, quite frankly. And uh, I've asked many of the technology companies I represent and their tech leaders, why is that the case? Can you simplify for us why this is accelerating? And it really comes down to a couple key technology trends we've got to keep in mind. One is, is cloud computing. As you know, the cloud is a global network of massive facilities filled with computers and hardware and software to run and process data remotely. They are computer farms, huge, gigantic warehouses, football fields long. And they're controlled and owned by companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft. And they rent out, they lease out this computing power to other enterprises to use to develop and accelerate their technologies. So as a result, companies are able to innovate and change and develop technology faster and cheaper by renting all of this power instead of having to buy it or invest in it. As a matter of fact, the Amazon cloud is the fastest growing business in the history of technology services, and it's expanding. The other thing that is going on that's ex contributing to this disruption is machine learning. Cloud computing is enabling computers to teach themselves. That's what's happening. They're teaching themselves. They now understand speech, and they recognize images. And it results in a tremendous amount of data and applications. For example, there's a smartphone application that you can buy very cheaply that can detect skin cancer equal to the diagnostic skills of a trained dermatologist. It's available today just because of the data and the algorithms of the data. Gene sequencing, sequencing the human genome. I remember representing some companies 10 years ago. It took almost 10 years and a billion dollars to sequence the first human genome. Today, the cost of sequencing DNA is under $1,000, and it can be done in a matter of a few days, just in a matter of 10 years. Doctors now will diagnose illness by comparing a patient's DNA to trillions of bits of information in the cloud so it can pinpoint illness. In other words, we can detect cancer, hopefully, before it becomes cancer. That's what's happening. And when you couple this with artificial intelligence, it's leading us to many disruptive places. Um, and we'll, we'll try to comment on that today and how we should put that in perspective. Of course, all of this innovation 
is also taking its toll. Uh, many questions are being asked. Is, is innovation reducing the need for people in many jobs? Is uh, this inconsistent with historical change? Uh, are we facing a future of stagnant income? Uh, is there going to be a deepening inequality? Uh, is investing going to be more challenging? Must it be more long-term uh, and more operational as opposed to financial engineering? And these are some of the questions that we hope to, to talk to you about today. Uh, some have suggested that the combination of technology, disruption, and the growth of large dominant companies is also having an impact in how we look at the purpose of a corporation. Uh, Larry Fink, uh, the head of BlackRock, issued a letter to many, many CEOs in January this year saying that the purpose of the for-profit corporation should be more than making money for shareholders. It should also have a purpose to do good for society. Uh, that is different than the norm that we face uh, as investors uh, and as fiduciaries of boards of directors when we are told that our obligation is to build shareholder value. Um, and it's interesting that that debate is going on. Um, many of you may know that the Department of Labor uh, just a couple of months ago issued a guidance to pension funds saying that if you're going to spend money or, or focusing on uh, things like uh, ESG, environment, society, and governance, be sure you correlate that to shareholder value. If it's not correlated to shareholder value, then don't spend time on it, was kind of the message of the Department of Labor. Quite frankly, somewhat in contrast to Larry Fink's view. So what is going on? Is the norm changing even in, in governance, which affects our obligations of how we manage portfolio companies and how we invest, and that's something we'll try to talk about today. And of course, this in turn is changing investing, which we will address. So I wanted to just open up uh, our meeting by giving this perspective. I think, uh, Ted, the, the next thing we're going to do is show some videos, and then Laura and Jimmy and I, with you, uh, will engage in some discussions on the impact of this. One of the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. We need a different economic model that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet and that will be focused not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. We have energy technologies that can power our civilization, but how do we get it and implement it at the scale we need at a price that people around the world can afford? If we're able to do something to transform cities, to make them more efficient, then the impact can be huge. We can use asset tracking, we can use IT, we can use 3D printing to decouple growth from the resource constraints we have. The question of adding quality to quantity, it's really about a diverse, safe, healthy and just world with clean air, clean water, clean energy. Together we are fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. The prediction of 5 million jobs lost by 2020 to technology is serious, but the main question is how will we define work? How will we share the wealth? How can you have a doctor that really knows a lot about data? How can you have a biologist that knows about medicine? We have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts, to think creative thoughts. We really need a new education or new training. We're working with a world in motion in FIRST Robotics, trying to encourage students from third grade all the way up through the end of high school to pursue science, math, and different technologies. It's this ability of digital technology to change outcomes, to truly empower people that can create a more equitable growth. Fourth Industrial Revolution has the potential to make 
inequalities visible and to make them less acceptable in the future. I was the first person in the world to be able to voluntarily move my legs while stepping in a robot. The cure will be possible if enough of the right people have the will to make it happen. We're seeing this incredibly exciting convergence of genome editing, DNA sequencing. Governments have a very important role to play in enabling the safe and effective use of technologies. We need to take responsibility at every level of society to adapt to these technological challenges which are redefining what it means to be completely embedded in this world. Even though we have everyday problems we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow. I call it. Think it pop. When we watch the 49ers, there'll be robots that we can't tell from humans. <laughs> I think that's what the last season looked like, Dutch. <laughs> um, some more uh, technology front. We'll certainly be break breaking all kinds of records in how long people live. I don't know that it'll be distributed across everybody, but definitely people will be living much longer. And uh, I think it's quite possible that we'll have quantum computing. Uh, I think we're going to know a lot more about the origin of the universe. Uh, you know, we're living in a time where that's coming. And when you, uh, sort of getting back to my original about the robots playing football and us not being able to differentiate, I think we're going to understand a lot more about what it means to be human. And I think, I think we will have robots that are pretty hard to differentiate from us, that when we talk to them, you know, it could feel pretty great to talk to them. And uh, they certainly will augment us and make us, uh, you know, eliminate what we consider drudgery in our lives, uh, for sure be able to make us much more creative. And, and then it'll be just plain hard to know uh, what it is, you know, who has a soul? Us, do the robots have a soul? Do we have a soul? What is a soul? You know, what is it to be human? I'm super excited to talk to you today about the present and future of artificial intelligence. Whenever there's a buzzword uh, and a complex subject matter, it's usually good to start with a definition. But it's actually a little tricky because the definition of artificial intelligence seems to be constantly moving. Whenever we solve a problem, we don't quite call it artificial intelligence anymore. It started with chess. A lot of smart researchers looked at other smart people and thought, well, we're really good at math and at logic and at playing complex games like chess. And so they started working on those kinds of problems, thinking that once they solve them, a lot of other things will just fall into place. But it didn't quite, because those were simulated environments that didn't have the, right, the same kind of noise that we have in the real world. So now, research has actually shifted largely from playing games, which is still an important area and can teach us some things, to things that we didn't used to consider as that much of uh, high intelligence, just understanding spoken words. Seems relatively simple, we can all do it. But that was actually a really hard problem up until 2010 when deep learning changed it and was able to make much more progress on this. And now, we don't call it AI anymore, it's just Siri, just a speech recognition software. But that was a really hard problem that we weren't able to solve. And there's still some tricky issues in research in it. In general, I think radiology will also have a huge impact uh, with AI. The problem with radiology is that we need a lot of training data. Because unlike in a blood scan or a pathology scan, you're looking for a thousand different things that could be wrong in a head CT scan. And it will take us a while 
before we could automate that entire process. So for a very long time, AI will work together with radiologists to improve that process. And in fact, we already know that we can identify certain things that can very quickly kill you. So for instance, a stroke or a so-called intracranial hemorrhage, brain bleeds, uh, those we can identify very quickly. And then without knowing all the other things that might be wrong in a head CT scan, we can put those to the top of the queue uh, in an emergency room setting. And that can already save lives. What makes me really excited and looking forward to this, uh, to the next couple of years, is the number of people that are now entering the field. It's, there's a lot of excitement in AI, and just in a class I, I co-taught with Chris Manning uh, earlier this year, we had over 660 students at Stanford attending that class, even though it's a graduate level class, and there are hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube of pretty technical material. And that is very exciting, but as we see AI uh, actually working, uh, we have to acknowledge also that it's just a tool, and it will stay a tool for the foreseeable future. We don't really have to worry about Skynet or Terminator kinds of scenarios. But what is important is to understand that tools can be used in good ways and in bad ways. In some ways, AI is just like the internet or hammer or cars. Right? You can use them as weapons, or you can use them to transport sick people. And it's important for us uh, to acknowledge that. The tools are only as good as the people and the political systems that end up using them. In fact, if we use them well, I think AI, and especially uh, AI-powered language capabilities, will allow us to improve our communication, to automate most of the basic human needs, like food. We can automate farming uh, with computer vision and some simple robotic control. We can build houses automatically and so on. I think in the end, as human intelligence and productivity gets enhanced, I hope that that will lead us to a future where we can focus on unique and creative tasks, and those kinds of tasks that require empathy, uh, where we care for each other, and we can basically automate a lot of the boring drudgery that is out there. With those videos, let's open up and have some discussion. Um, and let me first turn to the panel and uh, ask Laura for some of her general observations uh, before we get into specifics. Hit the middle button with the middle. speaking. Okay. Now it's red, so that means it must be on. <laughs> red is on. Uh, okay. Uh, I would start with the fact that um, th those were very interesting videos. Uh, they almost never, perhaps never, mentioned the issue of employment, jobs, income, wages. Uh, they mentioned things like soul, <laughs> the empathy, the, the development of creative tasks. Um, they didn't mention disruption. They didn't mention the cost to individuals companies or communities from disruption. Uh, so when an economist looks at these trends, they can see that as with past technological advances, and I only see AI and the increasing digitization of everything as a continuation of a technological trend of automation we've been living with for the last three to four decades. So it's accelerating, it's, it can do more, but we've lived with these trends before. So what, what do we know about them and what, what does that do to help us predict the future? Uh, for, first of all, we, we know that um, they have uh, been associated with an increase in productivity. That's a, that's a good thing, that's a good thing. That means that human labor applied to tasks leads to you can do it more efficiently, you can do it with yes, less labor, you get productivity growth, that drives economic growth. We know that. Um, and I think there's every reason to expect that the technologies we're talking about over the next several decades are going to continue to enhance human productivity. So what is available to distribute to use on the basis uh, for society, for individual humans, will become uh, more abundant. Uh, productivity is a positive thing. Usually the way productivity uh, has uh, led to new jobs 
is really through what we've seen in previous technological revolutions. So what happens is that technology makes labor more productive. That reduces the demand for labor in certain places. That increases incomes for people. That increases the demand for new goods and services. And voila, there are new jobs. There are different jobs, but there are new jobs. So it's important to think about, uh, as we go forward, how the productivity growth leads to an increase in incomes. Does it lead to an increase in incomes for uh, the middle? Does it lead for an increase in incomes which is uh, highly unequal? I would say that among economists right now, there may be a fair amount of disagreement about things like the pace of technological change uh, or the percentage of jobs at a given year that might be affected by technology. There actually is very little disagreement, sadly, about the fact that the technology we're talking about is likely to feed into more income inequality, not less, not less. So, uh, a lot of jobs are going to be changed. Some new jobs may be created. Those new jobs right now look to be in areas like care, home care, education, training, social welfare. These are not high paying jobs. They are jobs where creativity is required, where empathy is required, where humans may have a comparative advantage relative to machines. But the jobs that are being lost in manufacturing, for example. Uh, we heard about uh, technology that could build buildings in construction. Uh, those jobs are the jobs that actually are jobs that pay higher than average incomes, higher than median wages. And if you look at the kind of distribution of where you think the jobs are that are gonna be lost, and where you think the jobs are that are gonna be gained, what you have is a kind of situation where high-skilled, college and tertiary degree educated workers whose, whose skills are complemented by and enabled by the technology will actually find demand for their skills and their employment and their wages. But as you move down, almost like in a monotonic fashion, as you move down the educational and skills ladder, you're gonna see that the jobs that are, or the prediction is, you, maybe the prediction's wrong, uh, but the prediction is that you will see pressure on those uh, employment opportunities and therefore pressure on those wages. So uh, I want to sort of start with uh, that. I want to talk a bit about technological unemployment because the way sometimes this is put out there is that what the technology will do is lead to a large amount of unemployment. I actually think it's just more likely to lead to a large percentage of not very attractive jobs with not very good livelihoods. I don't, uh, technological unemployment would have to, would essentially be a case in which uh, the technology can do so many things that it's actually doing a lot of things that do require human skills. Uh, and, but the, uh, and I, tend to think that what will happen instead is a change in the sectoral composition of jobs uh, and a change in the income associated with different jobs, but we won't get technological unemployment. Most economists would agree with that. I'm kind of putting out there where I think the basic lines of agreement are. So if an economist were putting together that video, these are the kinds of things they would say. Um, another thing that they would say is even though there may not be much uh, technological unemployment, there's going to be, and Larry used this word in his introduction, a tremendous amount of disruption. So the, uh, I've been involved with, uh, there are a number of research institutes working on this. I've been involved with the McKinsey Global Institute, which is the think tank of McKinsey, but also there's a big interdisciplinary faculty group at uh, UC Berkeley looking at this issue of uh, the essentially how much disruption to labor markets is going to occur. And by disruption, I mean what percentage of the jobs currently out there could disappear. Uh, either the total job or the tasks that are done in the job, that would disrupt the jobs that people are in and require people to move to new jobs with new skills so th that number, again, economists 
agree that it's actually likely to be quite significant because the technology is moving so fast, powered by cloud computing, by big data, by machine learning, everything's moving faster. The people I've met over the years, in the past five years, who work on this have been themselves completely shocked at the speed at which this is occurring, breakthroughs occurring. They wouldn't have said five years ago that we were gonna get speech and visual recognition this soon. They would not have said that, and so here we are. Um, so how big is this disruption? So uh, in the McKinsey Global Institute for study, for example, the estimate is between now and 2030, about uh, a quarter of the jobs, of the tasks in the U.S. will be disrupted. So about 25% of the way they measure it is work hours. Work hours on current tasks will be disrupted, okay? That means they, disruption means they disappear. So then the question is, how are the, th those tasks will be done by machines? So then, what happens to those workers who used to do those tasks? What if 30% of the tasks that they do are automated? Will they actually uh, keep their job at two-thirds of work? Will the, will the employer cut down the workforce significantly and basically keep a much smaller workforce with most of the, a third of the tasks automated? Um, those are the kinds of questions that I think we, we need to think about because if the disruption is that significant, if it's 25% of work hours or 28% of work hours, what that means is a lot of people who are currently in the workforce doing things that they have the education and skills to do will find the jobs that they have significantly changed or the job opportunities they have significantly changed. They may need new skills. They may need new, and I'm, skills are not just going online to an educational uh, online provider, but actually uh, apprenticeships. We, we heard about this today, on-the-job training. Um, internships and apprenticeships for adults who basically are going to have to change the kinds of skills and jobs they do. Uh, transition help for adults, all of those things actually become very important. As, it, as does, by the way, and this is almost never looked at by anyone, the fact that the dislocation of some jobs may be in one place and the availability of new jobs may be in quite a different place. So there is actually not just the gaps between the skills required of one job and the skills of a new job, but there also is the location. Are you going to have to move? Is your family going to have to move? I mean, we kind of do this at the macro level. The macro level, we say, well, we think on balance that there will be enough new jobs. Okay, that's the fact that there will not be technological unemployment. Where will the new jobs come from? From things like health, education, training, infrastructure, very, very important. Alternative energy, very, very important. Okay, so we kind of have a sense that there are going to be jobs out there. We have a concern that I said that a lot of these jobs will be low income, low livelihood jobs, and I worry a lot about that. We also have the, re the possibility that, there, that job dislocation and job creation are in different places, and I think that's uh, important to consider. Um, let me just to add a couple other trends to the, our discussion. Uh, what is demography? So uh, the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development uh, in, uh, that looks at advanced industrial countries and the McKinsey Global Institute has looked at the implications of increasing automation for both the quantity of work, that's things like will there be enough jobs, and the quality of work, like that's what is the income associated with those jobs, and they've looked at the gap between the skills of the jobs that will disappear and the skills of the jobs that will be created. They've looked at all of those things, um, and they have uh, really focused on um, the importance in, the, in this whole period of time, therefore, of what should be the policy response. Okay, how, how do we reconfigure, uh, I think Larry mentioned the term social contract, but how do we reconfigure the way benefits, which historically went through work um, for an employer, 
uh, for many workers no longer go through work for an employer and for an increasing number of workers will probably go, not go through an employer. These international studies uh, like uh, the OECD or McKinsey Global Institute say, you know what, countries differ in this. They're going to differ in the challenge. So let's take uh, Germany and the U.S. Germany has a, a fairly significant declining labor force. So even if, and they are seeing this for sure, the robotization of manufacturing is taking out manufacturing jobs, uh, they have an a, 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 uh, aging population and a declining population, and therefore, uh, with their investments in things like health services, uh, they probably are going to have uh, able to really generate uh, enough jobs uh, for the future. Uh, without, there'll be a lot of disruption, but the amount of jobs is, seems to be uh, there. If you look at the U.S., the U.S., well, now I would say our demographics are getting a little uncertain. You might say by 2050, <coughs> if we fundamentally change our immigration policies, we too will face a declining uh, labor force. But for the foreseeable future, we don't. Uh, and so we actually have a bigger challenge than Germany in just keeping up job creation as people are displaced, as people are displaced. Germany has less of a challenge. So the demography, I want to put demography out there as a trend to discuss, because I think that matters. A um, couple other trends that I just want to put out there, because I think in this discussion they're relevant. One is market power. Economists in general are becoming very concerned about the power of these very large, global, very few companies to basically set, set markets around the world according to their in internal logic and stakeholders. Amazon being a clear example in the retail industry. Um, market power can affect many things. It can affect for example, if you look at the supply chain of Apple, which has been well looked at around the world, Apple is such a major force that actually most of the value of an Apple phone is extracted by Apple and by the relatively small number of people who work for Apple. There are lots of suppliers of input into Apple phones who don't have the market power to negotiate effectively with Apple. Apple has the power to determine set. It has great negotiating power. Let's just put it that way. Okay. That's an example on the product side. Let's go to the employer side. So what if you are an individual worker and you are working uh, for a very large platform economy, a platform company? Uh, I'll use Uber. Okay. You don't really have the ability to set the terms of that contract. There's no organization for the voice of labor in setting that contract. So you have a very significant market player on one side, and you have a not uh, organized negotiator on the other side. So I want to put out market power because I think it is an important consideration. And then finally, I just want to put out globalization because we're <laughs> Right now, the news is filled with issues of trade and trade policy. And I th think uh, two points I want to make here. Uh, one is I think the weight of global trade is going to continue to shift to Asia. It's going to continue to shift to Asia. Um, and Asia trade uh, is very much driven by China, sort of, and links throughout Asia. So in thinking about your investment strategy, I think focus on Asia and focus on companies positioning in Asia and focus on, on trends in Asia is very, very important. I think we're going to continue to see a really serious competition between the U.S. and China in anything related to technology. The Chinese have targeted, they have lots, uh, targeted all of the high-tech sectors we've talked about as places they want a preeminent position and they have massive resources to put behind that. Um, I want to put this in historical perspective. You know, in the, in the 19th century, the U.S. targeted manufacturing, uh, you know, un under the 18th century, with Alexander Hamilton. We, we kind of did these things. We basically said, we're going to do this. We're going to throw all of our resources at this. We're going to be the premier country in this area. There is lots of historical examples of countries doing this. 
China is committed and is well endowed to do it, I would say. So again, you have to think about that. And, and I do worry right now that in our attempt, this gets to my last point about short-termism versus long-term. A lot of what I've said about trends, I'm thinking about trends between now and 2030. A lot of the McKinsey work that I've done looks at trends between now and 2030. That's reasonably long term. The, the, the trade policy that we are currently pursuing in the United States is entirely short term. And the reason I want to emphasize this is to think about something Larry said. Let's assume that for reasons of basic economics, um, the growth of a lot of technological opportunities, investment opportunities, is going to be driven uh, out of what happens in Asia, okay? And a lot of U.S. companies, big companies, have significant investments and customers in Asia, and in particular in China. If we antagonize the Chinese, a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do is to start to restrict in serious ways what those companies can do in China. That's a perfectly reasonable thing for them to do. Uh, and I think we have to be concerned that that is what they might do. So I would say that's a long term. If we want a long term strategy, we want a strategy which actually will support technological development, support the sharing of knowledge, support all of the benefits to the world that come from the technology, whether it's developed in China or in the US, or sometimes by US companies in China, or sometimes by Chinese companies in the US. That, that's really what we need. Those are going to be the two economic powers where this technological explosion is focused, China and the US. So we better, if we're thinking about the long term, get that set of relationships right. Otherwise, I think we endanger uh, the, the, sh the sharing of the, of the benefits of this uh, for the world. Uh, let me just add with a quote that I, I got involved in all of this a few years ago. There was a very important book written at the time. Some of you may have read it. It was by Thomas Piketty. It was about uh, capital. It was called Capital in the 21st Century. It looked at trends of income and wealth inequality. And he predicted that income and wealth inequality was, uh, that it had gotten worse over the last 40 years and that it was going to continue to get worse. He did not talk about technological change, except in the most kind of assumed technological change. He didn't really, okay. Uh, right around the same time, another book came out called The Second Machine Age uh, by Ed McAfee and uh, Eric Brynjolfsson. Very, very good book. I recommend both of them to you, but I recommend reading them side by side, <laughs> okay? Because they said, oh my goodness, the technology is moving very, very fast. It's going to affect the quality of jobs, the income coming from employment. That's, so when I say, sometimes I use the word livelihood, sometimes I use quality of jobs, sometimes I've used uh, income inequality. All of those things worried about, well, yeah, there will be jobs, but will they be jobs that give us livelihoods that we as a society for most people find acceptable, okay? So they were very worried about and they said, well, we have to now start to think about technologies moving so fast. How do we as a society move as fast as we can to change the social contract to keep up? To which I said, that's not how, well, I, I said to myself, the concern I have is societies don't rapidly change their social contracts unless under the duress of revolution or war, or it's not very likely. We better get started on this now. And I wrote a sentence which I, I, I will paraphrase here. The challenge is not really the intelligent machines. The challenge is how we distribute equitably uh, the returns generated by the intelligent machines. That that is ultimately the challenge. We cannot, I don't think we should stop technology. I don't think we can anyway. I think that has all of the amazing benefits that you saw here. The benefits are huge. The potential is huge. But we have to worry about human dislocation. We have to worry about human livelihoods. We have to m worry about the scale of the disruption along the way and helping communities and people and countries 
make that transition. So let me stop there. Those are wonderful themes, and I, I really concur. And before I ask Jimmy for some comments, uh, a point I'd like to reemphasize uh, that Laura made very well is, is what I call the globalization of it all. Um, it's very interesting uh, to see the debate uh, politically that is going on that we have to deal with, which Laura characterizes correctly as, as short-termism, uh, trade, uh, immigration, um, defense, uh, very short-term driven, uh, not inconsistent historically. But what's happening uh, from a viewpoint of uh, technology and innovation and enterprise gr growth is it's very long-term. Uh, these companies, in, even in the US, uh, are thinking globally long-term. The, the Chinese companies have 25, 50-year business plans, not three to five-year business plans. And the technology roadmap suggests that if you are going to scale uh, and, and grow, you, you need longer-term vision. Uh, and, and this is at odds with a lot of the politics that is going on, uh, with trade discussion. Uh, and it is at odds with a lot of nationalism because these companies are truly, truly global, if you look at Apple or Google. And uh, much of the, uh, many of the obstacles that they run into deal with local laws and local regulations and local cultures that are lagging behind all of this change. Because as you know, the, the law is the last to change, right? Uh, we, we lawyers are, are historians, and uh, we're lagging behind. And we've never lagged behind uh, so fast and so far because the, of the exponential growth of, of it all. So Laura's point about um, not only a dislocation of jobs, but the social contract and the human contract is we have to think, uh, quite frankly, if we are going to address these issues, we have to think globally, notwithstanding a short-term political rhetoric, and that is a lot of the tension that we in the enterprise space feel when dealing with that. Um, but, but Jimmy, uh, I know you're gonna speak later, and, and, and I'd like you to wait until later because you're gonna have a great input on infrastructure, but your observations from your end, you're involved so much in the scope of the digital impact. Uh, how yeah. Are you? Well, uh, thanks, Larry. I, I think, Laura, you teed up a lot of the, the macro themes that I think will be very interesting for the, the group to discuss. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll uh, leave those for the moment. I think McKinsey does two things. One is what you were describing around thinking about broad trends, trying to help uh, groups, uh, industries, public sector entities think about where things are going. The other uh, side of what we do is around um, supporting individual companies or individual groups implement some of the things that, that we're talking about today and thinking about which ones make sense for which industries, which ones um, uh, you know, don't make sense, and how does this actually happen? Because it is happening, and so we, we are part of that journey and I couldn't help but, but reflect a little bit on, um, on the micro side of this, which is there's a, a, a global trend in the direction of everything that, that we just discussed, but, um, but there are uh, big differences between what individual or companies are actually doing and which ones are leading and which ones aren't, which ones are moving in this direct direction, which ones are, which ones are having difficulties making the the, uh, the decisions that, that we just teed up. And so as an investment group, I think understanding that micro difference, while some of these big trends are happening and there are things we, uh, we have to consider, um, it's also important to think about what are the individual things that are happening for, for specific companies in, uh, in some of the markets we just described. Yep. Let me just pause a moment and just ask, uh the board, whether there are any questions or comments as we keep moving on. Yes, please. Sorry, uh, Ms. Pigman, please. Turn your mic on, please. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. 
wanted to thank the panelists this morning and also the staff for working on this. Uh, Controller Yi had, is very interested in this topic and has written about this and spoken quite a bit about it as well too. And unfortunately she was in an automobile accident over the weekend mm -hmm. and she's resting comfortably at home under doctor's orders um, before she returns back mm -hmm. to work later this week. But very sad to not be able to hear this mm -hmm. in person today. But I think um, some of the themes that you touched on in our work here at CalPERS, we talk a lot about the three forms of capital, the um, physical form, the uh, financial, and the human capital, human capital. Right. and which we are, are very um, concerned about as we undergo these technological shifts. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what as investors we should be looking at, we're looking at both the risks and potential opportunities for the human capital side, and also um, how do you start to drill down to look at some of the micro differences between these corporations and what are they actually doing and thinking. And then I think the other question also in mind is as investors and as uh, government, what are the appropriate considerations for investors and also for public policy considerations going forward and how do we work with corporations to address these changing shifts? Those are great questions, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, Laura and Jimmy have reactions to it. Uh, let's let's talk about the investing side because I think uh, I think that is very very important, um, and uh, change is occurring there also. And I think your question leads to that: how we should think about it. Um, you know, uh, when you break down uh, investing, um, you look first at the private sector. And as you know, uh, that's broken down maybe in a, a first bucket, uh, the so-called venture capital world, this, which deals with very early staged enterprises. Then the second bucket is often referred to as growth capital and private equity, where you're dealing now with more mature business models, uh, where investing becomes uh, bigger checks, uh, with more established uh, visibility. And then, you know, of course, you have your, your third bucket where your large established public enterprises. And uh, what is interesting is that dynamic uh, is changed among those three buckets. Uh, so, for example, in, in, in the world of venture capital financing, with all of this innovation, uh, and all of this dramatic change, uh, it is very clear uh, that there is a lot more capital out there chasing uh, many, many startups. So the uh, number of new enterprises is accelerating, uh, and, and the opportunities are accelerating, but the capital is very, very diffused um, and uh, very high risk. Uh, and you are facing uh, the dominance of these large corporations that are really becoming an exit strategy for a lot of private companies. But what I mean by that is the model we had, you know, prior to uh, 2000 uh, that was so successful for uh, 30 years was you go, you start a company in the technology space I'm referring, and in a matter of five years or so, you go public, uh, and that was the exit strategy for your investment, and you built a public company, and the number of U.S. public companies grew exponentially. We had uh, oh, close to um, 6,000 of them, maybe 5,700 of them. Well, that's changed. If you look today, uh, the number of U.S. public companies is down by half. We have under 2,500. Uh, so what has happened is that companies are staying private longer, and these big conglomerate industrial companies, technology companies, both in the U.S. and in China mainly, are buying these companies and getting bigger. Uh, and that has become an exit strategy. Uh, when you look at private equity, uh, you can argue that all of this uh, innovation has also changed the model. Um, you, you can argue that a lot of the key of early private equity was financial engineering. Uh, the ability to use leverage, debt, uh, coupled with an equity check, 
to maximize the cash flow and have an exit. Um, but today, given the disruption and the length of these business models, uh, that is much more difficult to do. Uh, I would argue that the private equity model uh, is very stressed, uh, and, and, and Ted is, has talked about that. Um, uh, you can argue today <clears throat> that <clears throat> as we look at our private equity strategies, it has to be more long-term and have long, longer duration and rather rely upon financial engineering because of the disruption of these technologies and the globalization, you need more operational efficiencies as opposed to financial engineering. Uh, and then you think of the broad public investing and you can see that a lot of uh, public investing uh, has, um, has not generated the kind of returns that it historically done. Some people will, are, will say that alpha returns in investing are now in the private market because companies are staying private. That's a long-winded way of addressing a very important question, and that is all of this disruption we've talked about, given the size and globalization of it, and the reinventing of business models has required us to think of investing differently. And of course, I know that the board is looking very much at these kinds of strategies. But Laura, your observation <laughs> on that? No, no. Like I think those are all uh, really important points. I, I, it's interesting to think about. Um, I want to add to it. I, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, so this is just some additional thoughts related to this. Uh, first of all the capital intensity of investment. So let's think about, we, we just passed a very, very dramatic, uh, significant reduction uh, in corporate tax rates, which should, at the margin, uh, uh, actually help quite significantly the publicly traded companies. So um, we passed that with the hope that it would unleash a significant amount of investment and that that would create jobs and wages. If it is the case that a lot of that investment is going to be in uh, things which are labor displacing or labor substituting, uh, then actually we, we may get the investment boom without the employment effects uh, that we expect. We, we may not get the investment boom itself because uh, essentially a lot of the investment that firms make is intangible capital and in uh, essentially uh, software and algorithms, not the same as building roads and building buildings, okay? So the actual dollar investment triggered by a tax uh, cut and the employment effects may be different. So that's, a, that's another change. So what, what is capital? What is investment? What are the implications of investment for, for, for jobs. I would put that there. Um, a second change I would lay out there is really interesting you mentioned the Department of Labor. There is, uh, Larry Fink is not alone. Uh, CalPERS is very involved in this too uh, as a major investor. There is a growing fraction of the money, avail the investable funds available out there interested in sustainability. Sustainability has a very broad definition. Some it is, you know, sustainability narrowly defined as environmental and, and you can measure it pretty, uh, pretty easily. Uh, and um, there's, you know, I'm, I sit on the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and we're trying to develop for investors like CalPERS and any investor a set of measures of sustainability that actually are of material significance. So you would not get the kind of DOL warning that, well, don't pay attention to sustainability if it's gonna cost you profits because the whole SASB approach is saying, look, there are many, many sustainability indices where we actually think investment is gonna be positively associated with profits. It's not a negative, it's not an either or. So what I wanna say here is a trend going on, I think, and you can see it in the numbers, is a growing amount of a share of investable funds around the world saying they are interested in sustainability. If they're not just interested in automation, they're interested in automation in a sustainable way. So what does that mean? Um, I think uh, uh, I'm gonna go now to think about talent because uh, human physical capital 
uh, human talent. If you're looking at a company, it seems to me, and they're saying what really matters to us to be sustainable is our human talent, I would actually look pretty fast at, okay, would you please give me the skill distribution of your current workers? Would you please give me what you think in five years? AT&T can do this, by the way. What you think the skill distribution of the remaining jobs is gonna be? What's your training strategy for getting the workers who are currently there who wanna stay trained for those jobs? What's your strategy for actually putting out in the marketplace through Udacity or Coursera Again, I'm using the AT&T example, training, uh, training modules which people can take with the view that five years from now, those are the kind of jobs that are going to be available at AT&T. If a company says, I care a lot about talent, but actually their talent is very highly skilled, mostly college and tertiary educated workers, uh, they're, they probably kept, came with a fair amount of investment in their own human capital, and probably the firm is doing a fair amount to keep them uh, a pace with technology, but I want to say uh, the trend in U.S. companies uh, and in companies around the world, I'm not I'm leaving out China here, is basically not to, to talk a lot about talent, but actually if you look at talent investment as a share of various, uh, various measures, sales, revenues, profits, things like that, not, not, nothing particular going on there. Actually, the trend is actually down. So if you're, if you're thinking, I want to be a sustainable investor, I care about sustainability and human talent, the company says they care about human talent, yeah, well then, look at what they're doing in human talent. Look at where they're recruiting, look at the talent base that they have, look at their plans for talent. And again, I think the longer term you can get the perspective here. What I, what I like about the AT&T example, it's not 20 years, but at least it's that they got a 10-year horizon of what they think is going to happen to their talent needs and how they're going to contribute to trying to develop that talent base. Okay, so the, those are some thoughts. And finally, I was going to ask Jimmy, I think it's still the case, a few years ago, uh, McKinsey Global Institute did a very nice study where they came up with something like 25 measures of the degree of digitization. Uh, and so this would be looking at a company. How digitized are they in human resources? How about sales? How about uh, supply chain? Every place. How about their environment? Okay. Right. You could actually rank companies on these digitization scores within sectors. And lo and behold, what you find is the ones that are the most digitized are also tend to be the most profitable. They tend to be the ones with the highest wages. They tend to be the ones with the biggest market share. They are finding ways to use the digital technology to gain real competitive advantage in their industry. So these are really important indicators. I would look at them as well. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. no, I, I think that's a, a great point. It goes exactly where, where my mind went with your question about um, the, the micro analysis, company by company. And I, I think it probably uh, is worth mentioning that there's a lot of innovation happening in a lot of industries that has relatively few negative implications, and none in many cases. So I work in the infrastructure industry, and there are huge opportunities to improve transparency into what's happening at job sites that lets decision makers, safety. exactly, safety, um, the quality of the work that's being done. <clears throat> so it, for, for me, I think it's, it's about uh, taking the investor view. It's about thinking about which are the, um, the metrics that, that matter to you and which are the ones within a given industry that you think will help drive uh, the outcome you're looking for, whether it's <laughs> operational effectiveness, financial effectiveness, or it's something that, that for a values or sustainability reason is not something that you want to be associated with and thinking about which technologies is that specific company having success in and which ones are they prioritizing, either in the public statements they're making or what you can see from the work they're, they're doing. That's great. So we have several other um, questions from the board, if, if I may. Um, uh, Ms. Hollinger. Thank you. Um, I want to, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thanks, staff and the panel. Um, I'm very appreciative for all your input and your time. Um, Laura, I have two questions for you um, regarding um, investing in China. Um, what has always been challenging for CalPERS is uh, regarding our ESG 
getting uh, comfortable with transparency around numbers. Um, obviously, board diversity is an issue for us, as well as um, how the uh, treatment of the labor force, including the supply chain. So how do we bridge that? That's my first question. And then my second question is, knowing China has approximately over 1.3 billion in population, how are they dealing with this issue of uh, the disruption caused by technology and creating a li living wage? Mm -hmm. So on the first point, I think it, I think it is very complicated to invest in large uh, Chinese companies. I, I think that historically speaking, what has happened is two things. Number one, uh, American firms themselves have set up significant operations there. Even the ones that are have been concerned about intellectual property and things like that, they have decided the size of the market and the size of the talent pool because they also employ a lot of the engineers and researchers that are coming out of universities. So they, they say the size of the market and size of the talent pool, this is a place we need to be. So it's, it's easier to think about investing with those companies than in the Chinese companies themselves because they're, so that's the first thing. The second thing that has happened in China is that some of the big companies have also invested in, uh, in small private private companies in China. There is actually a, a very significant non-state sector in China. And there's a lot of entrepreneurship in China. And there are a lot of new ideas in China. So well, I'm really concerned that uh, investors in the United States who would like to have the opportunity to buy into the development of those entities and to support them may actually face policy blocks because of what's happening. But I do understand that the the lack of transparency for uh, in, in large corporate entities would be a difficult thing, absolutely. Um, so I would look at, so um, when McKinsey kind of looked at the issue of where the jobs of the future might come from, they basically said, well, in a country like China, where you have a very large and rapidly growing middle class, it's going to come from things to serve those consumers. It's actually a pretty simple answer, right? <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, they, to the extent that they continue uh, on their infrastructure investments around the world through one, you know, one road, one bridge. What is it? one road, one? It's not a bridge. Belt. Path? Belt. 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 Belt, thank you. I was blanking on what it was. I knew it was B, <laughs> but the belt. Okay, so there's gonna be a lot of infrastructure demand. There's gonna be a lot of consumer <clears throat> demand. There's gonna be a lot of healthcare demand. I mean, because they're really building their healthcare system. So all of the sectors where McKinsey Global Institute would, would say, look, where are jobs going to come from in the next, between now and 2030? All of those are well positioned for growth in China. Yeah. Okay, so that's another kind of investment clue. Um, so on livelihoods, living wages in China, you know, um, they do have, uh, and so does Germany, more robots now per, uh, per worker than the United States. Uh, they are facing a, even though we don't think of it this way, a, the prospect of a declining labor force. It happens first in Germany, but it does happen in China. Uh, they are, uh, to a certain extent, um, people who People who migrated to some of the developed regions on the coast, migrated to places like Foxconn, are now going back to the to the to their uh, roots. And there's been a lot of ur of new urban development in China to try to create uh, places for alternative for, for for new jobs in consumer goods and services that this massive middle income population will want. Right. Um, so. I think they, they would understand that there is an automation and disruption challenge, and I think, but I think they are of the view that they, there will be jobs that uh, will, that they, because of the trends I said, jobs will be forthcoming. And of course, the issue of what kinds of 
labor market protections and policy protections, those are all embedded in sort of the, the, the Chinese answer to these kinds of questions, which is very different than ours and very different than, uh, say, a country that I've been uh, decided we should understand much more because it's a big country and it's more similar to us than China, although it's still very different from us, is, is Germany. Because Germany does have, they seem to have managed to, while uh, you've seen the erosion in manufacturing jobs, you've seen the automation, they have managed through training programs and education programs to actually move people with new skills into related activities without a kind of hit on their wages. So I think we have to look to see what can be done. Thank you. Ms. Taylor. Thank you, Madam President. So I wanted to thank you, Mr. Sonsini and Laura and James for a really good presentation. I will have to say your slideshow and there was that woman that was Dying. Talking about robotics, yeah. she was kind of scary. She was kind of, <laughs> yeah, she was kind of way out there. Yeah, I was. agree. Was kind of I was thinking there. Terminator the whole time. <laughs> she said it wasn't Terminator. I know, but, but, but then she talked about Terminator. So, but I want to um, bring it down to policy at this point, and I think um, uh, Ms. Paquin talked about you know disruption <coughs> and labor. I'm concerned about that, of course, but I also think that we need to, um, as investors, think about, and you mentioned this, Laura, earlier, about um, communities, and, and um, as a pension fund, we rely on taxes, not just our members. So the disruption isn't just with our you know, workers or our, even our own members. The disruption <coughs> comes to the tax base of the state of California. Yes. Yeah. Um, I am a tax collector so oh, okay. <laughs> by trade, mm -hmm. but I, I see that as a huge impairment for states um, and localities in terms of, of how they move it forward. So I want to know what you guys, what you all are thinking in terms of policy and whether or not investors and pension boards should be working together to change, like you said earlier, that right now the policy from the DOL has changed. It's, it's kind of a, a dead horse at this point in right. terms of ESG. But should we be working on that policy to protect a tax base? I know that Ms. Yi had written a white paper on some okay. solutions, actually, for okay. the state of California for this disruption in technology. And so I wanted to know um, what your thoughts are on whether or not there should be some sort of involvement. I know there's some investors that aren't really playing that, you know, into the ESG strategy part, but the ones that are, should we be mm -hmm. also investing time in policy mm -hmm. for local, state, and national policies? I think that uh, we should. Uh, I'd like to pick up um, on the point of, of the role of ESG sustainability uh, in all of these strategies, because I think that underlines your question, and I think that is the right question. Um, uh, I think that we have to begin, first of all, with uh, uh, the state of the union when it comes to fiduciary obligations of the directors of these companies we invest in. They live in a world of what we call shareholder primacy, and that is uh, the law is, is that you look to build shareholder value first and sometimes only. Uh, I believe that we're going through a schizophrenia now on that. Um, this law, uh, this norm of shareholder value first and foremost, uh, really uh, began in the 1980s during the junk bond era, the era of takeovers and hostile takeovers. Prior to then, we had a different world. Go back to the great uh, Detroit treaty between General Motors and United Auto Workers, where uh, no one claimed that uh, the rights of employees wasn't a constituency that board of directors should not address. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was no challenge to that uh, treaty, that contract. 
it was thought to be good. Uh, no one said, well, what happens to shareholder value? Flash forward to today. Uh, we are now seeing uh, the rhetoric coming forth, Larry Fink's letter, um, where, wait a minute, if these corporations are going to be so big and so disruptive and so global, um, how can they not take into account ESG and sustainability because they're displacing society, displacing jobs, changing education? And I think that that is a growing trend. And I would project that long-term investing that's really going to generate returns that we have to generate to cover our pension obligations can be improved with proper governance and ESG and sustainability principles. I think you can correlate them to value. And, uh, and, and to your point raised earlier, uh, this is very difficult when it comes to China investing. Because in China, you have the silent hand of the Chinese government. And they are pretty much balancing the globalization and disruption of technology with their own political and demographic issues. And they just shut certain things down. Cryptocurrency is a no-no as an investment opportunity in China. The government just said no. In the United States, we're trying to figure it out still. Is it a security? Is it a commodity? How do we, we're, we're, we're spending millions of dollars, investing millions of dollars, and China just said, nope, we're not gonna go there, we got other issues. So, you know, ESG is very difficult uh, in, in the Chinese investments that I'm involved with. Uh, and, and, and there is a tension in, in this global race. So I, I do think that investors, and, and I think CalPERS is a leader here and will be and has an opportunity to be a leader here, is to put in perspective long-term investing coupled with proper principles of ESG and sustainability that will address many of these demographic issues. That is a new way of looking at investing today. Um, and I think that you're very right to be debating this issue here, and I think others have to as well. Does that make sense, Laura? I mean, do you? Yeah, and, and I would say, for, I, I would say, I completely agree with you. I think, as we've been talking about trends in technology, but there really has been, throughout the 2000s, but really taking real, real significant uh, pressure in the last decade, is a, just a growing percentage of investors who care about these issues a growing set of institutions, whether they're institutions like CalPERS or institutions like uh, CamRaView, people that actually provide services to investors interested in this. So it's going to be ultimately the pressure of the investors which does this, okay? Maybe in China it's the pressure of the state trying to figure out how am I gonna balance social responsibility and growth or social responsibility and innovation. In the U.S., I don't think right now we're, we're at a point where we're asking those questions at a policy point of view. We're, we're asking them as an investor point of view, and how do you represent different uh, stakeholders. And I, I mentioned SASB in passing. There's just a lot of effort now to develop criteria that interested investors can use to really assess um, the significance of the sustainability criteria to performance. Um, and I think that's a, a, a really important thing that's going on. Um, on the issue of labor voice, I just want to mention one thing because I do think that I mentioned, for example, in my discussion of, say, Lyft or Uber, that the individual driver doesn't have, have any power in negotiating. I mentioned uh, Germany, and of course, in Germany, one of the theories is it's not just a difference in policy, but it's a difference in the composition of the board and the voice of labor on boards, which leads to a different deployment of the technology, a different set of tr investment and training, a different set of transition mechanisms. And of course, um, those things, I think we, we don't, we have uh, in the US a declining uh, percentage of the workforce with any organized labor uh, protections, and um, I think that uh, mm -hmm. that may change over the next 50 years. I, I tend to think that what we're going to get 
is more of the construction industry, or I will call it the Hollywood industry guild-like structure. So you'll get these organizations of labor that are sectorally specific, trying to deal with all the individual workers who are in construction, or all the individual workers who are Hollywood writers. Those are two extremes, but they both have guild-like structures. So I think that is possibly another source of pressure. So we have the investor pressure, we have the pushback from labor. I want to say on taxes, I would be very interested in seeing the paper you mentioned. I, I think California, so I've been doing a little work with um, a couple of members of the California Senate. He, here's a big problem for California, but it's true for the nation too. So 70% or more of what is produced in California is service industry. So, we, if you were thinking of any kind of taxation that was a taxation on a product, a kind of value added or sales approach, you, which is, I think, gonna have to be in our future as a way to raise revenue. I don't think we're gonna ever be able to capture the amount of revenue that may be required for doing some of the things we're talking about through, um, raising income taxes. I think we're at, in California, we, we are pretty uh, up there in terms of the rate. Uh, we could possibly do something on va value add and sales taxes, but notice, I just want to emphasize, those are primarily would have to be on service sector providers. So I think we should uh, move on to other questions. We do still have a few board members um, who want to speak. Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Larry, uh, Laura, and James, thank you very much for your insightful uh, op observations in this uh, emerging uh, current disruptive environment that we, we're in. And my question kind of goes to, I guess, James, you responded to, we were talking about the macro uh, areas, and then you said, well, we can't forget about the micro issues. Right. And that raises the question about Looking forward in the future, you know, you have to look at the rule of law of different countries. You have to look at what their public policies are in terms of looking at these micro issues. And so my question is, do you envision some of these dis disruptive technologies advancing faster in certain areas, uh, countries, than others? And so that we get a sense of, you know, because we can't deal with everything, but where should you know, what do you think the concentration will be in certain types of growth in technology over the world? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a great question. And I think, Laura, you, you highlighted Germany earlier as, as a leader. I think countries that are more industrially advanced are uh, at the forefront in most cases of many of the technologies that, that we described earlier. I think that, um, there are also countries like China that are focusing on uh, making step changes. And so they are, in some cases, um, stepping beyond the technologies of today and tomorrow and looking for those five years down the road in order to stake a place in the, in the global economy. Um, but it really, I mean, it, it depends on the industry. It depends on the, the individual country, and in some cases, the region of the country so again, if I put my in investor hat on here, I, I think it does come down to um, if there are specific industries that, that the, the board is interested in exploring, thinking about going to the micro level of that industry by region, by uh, the competitive landscape within that industry and figuring out uh, who is leaning forward and who's not in both positive directions and, and negative directions. And I know that's a little bit of a cop out to your question, but um, it's the it's the reality. I think I don't know if, if either of you have a different opinion. So, so I think I I would only I, look. I actually think that's that's right. We need you need to look at the industry. You look at need to look at the firm and in industry. And in a very large uh, country like China or the U.S., you're going to have to look at the region too. I mean, you need you need to look at all of those things absolutely because there are different degrees of state regulation. So even if you're thinking about um, ESG issues. California has different standards than, uh, I don't know, Kentucky does. So in the same, the same f sector, the, s the same uh, set of firms, but different policy environments. So I think that's uh, one thing. 
I, I'm struck by, I've heard now three different times from three different uh, panels uh, with people from China say that in the U.S., when we have discussions about technology, we tend to worry about the concerns, and I, I will mea culpa here, I was putting out concerns for you. They would say, in China, this is not how the population thinks about this. The population thinks about technological change as completely enabling as basically making their lives better. They're actually not, maybe they're not that concerned about the employment effects because they figure that the, that the state will kind of uh, deal, deal with this in some way uh, from a macroeconomic policy perspective, from moving people around, from developing new infrastructure projects that will create domestic demand. There's a lot of domestic demand in China. So basically move people towards those jobs but help them find the place and skills they need. So it's really interesting to imagine that there's a different general attitude. Pew surveys in the United States say that most Americans are very concerned about technology. They're concerned about the effect on their jobs or on their livelihood. That is just, they don't do surveys like that in, in China, but the general atmospherics appear to be very positive. Um, a quick, one very specific answer to your question, Henry. Two areas where I think a difference in um, of regulation could lead to different outcomes, different speeds. So in China, we kind of know that we're, there's going to be less control over genomic research than there is going to be in the U.S. Okay? So basically, all of this stuff of uh, basically uh, the new technology which allows you to do this very rapidly and can you create new kinds of genetic uh, organisms going forward, those concerns which have deep moral uh, and ethical issues in the United States, I think it's a little bit of more like just see where the science takes you in China. I've heard that about drones, too, that, that there's a lot of development of drones for personal use, in, including ultimately uh, drones that are large enough for personal transportation use, where basically people are out there racing ahead, and there isn't a kind of sense right now. It's kind of a deregulatory playground. Just do it, and then we'll kind of figure out and pose the regulation later. <laughs> it's a very different attitude. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, we have another uh, question from Ms. Brown. Thank you, Madam President. Um, none of your bios um, mentioned whether or not you were um, registered with the SEC as investment advisor, so I'd like to ask that question individually. Uh, I am not. As a lawyer, I'm, I'm not uh, required to. Yeah. No, and, and I'm not either. I, uh, the, nor at, is SASB advising the SEC. They're just trying to develop standards that the SEC might someday find interesting, but it's actually a nonprofit uh, organization. And I'm not either. Okay. Um, because I'm, I'm curious here as to whether or not we're getting investment advice from the three of you. I know, Mr. Sonsini, in the past, you've been giving us legal advice as to our board governance structure, but I also do hear some uh, investment advice as we're talking about innovation and doing VC investing and staying sort of um, regionalized in Silicon Valley and then focusing on sort of a niche market like life sciences. And so I'm just, I'm concerned that we're sort of um, crossing legal advice with in investment advice here. And I, I just trying to figure out what it is that you're uh, telling us here, because you're saying local, and then Ms. Tyson, you're saying, look at Asia. And so I'm just a little confused about the advice you're giving us here. I think what we are trying to do is, is summarize the, the trends that are out there and not really giving any advice. Uh, what we're doing is summarizing how all of these constituencies uh, are looking at uh, their disciplines and and what are the factors that are in play uh, in the venture firms, the private equity firms, the large public firms, the, the government agencies, in dealing with investing during disruptive technology uh, interruption. Uh, so we're, we're trying to inform, uh, really not advise, uh, to give you the data that's out there and some of the issues that we're facing and dealing with. My, my focus is always sort of the broader macro trends, which 
I would say personally influence me as an investor, but I'm a very, I'm a very risk averse personal investor. So I, I think it's important to understand these macro trends from the point of view of large institutional investors like CalPERSON. You, you all have, you know, you've really uh, embraced uh, sustainability principles. You are basically looking at your investments, I think, in terms of the kinds of trends we're talking about. But uh, I, I certainly would not want you to take any investment advice from me. <laughs> nor, nor me. Yeah, I, I would just echo what the rest of the panel said. I, I think uh, we have um, uh, observations and insights about these markets, but certainly uh, this is not investment advice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Not seeing no, I don't see any other board members raising their hand at this moment. But, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Alipas, please. Yeah, I'll just say I've, I've been fortunate to uh, attend investor meetings all over the globe with some of the great uh, private and public investors all over the globe. And these are exactly the type of forums that, uh, that they seek out and that we seek out for this uh, broader range of perspective of uh, participants in the marketplace from from different, um, uh, different perspectives, whether it's macroeconomic or business consulting advice or governance advice. So um, it's a very familiar type of setting and discussion for investors, particularly sophisticated uh, global investors that seek out this type of advice for all the benefits that I think we're seeing. Yeah, and I would just remind that this is an educational session. It's not, um, a, it's not an investment advisory session. Um, so I have a couple of observations slash questions. Uh, one is that it's, it's interesting to me to hear how the conversation around demographics has changed so dramatically over just the past decade. I mean, I think just 10 years ago, people, we were talking about demographic changes, particularly it, or um, an aging workforce as a negative. China, Japan facing these real challenges of having declining uh, workforce because of the aging population and the you know, lower um, reproductive rates, et cetera. But today, in the age of AI, it seems actually to be an advantage in a sense because um, it, particularly if we're going to see employment decline as a result of uh, technology disruption, then it, it seems like it actually uh, could be an advantage for a country. Is that what you were saying, Ms. Tyson? Tyson. Yeah, I think one of the things that we, the, so the McKinsey Global Institute study looked at a number of countries and they basically said, okay, here's our projection uh, about the number of jobs that will be lost to automation, okay? Here's our projection of the size of the workforce between now and 2030. Is it growing rapidly? Is it declining? Uh, here are the sectors where we think jobs will come from. When you net all that out, uh, do you end up with enough jobs for the size of the workforce you have? It turns out in the German case, the answer is yes. It turns out in the US case, the, we need a little help. We need a little help. We need some more investment in infrastructure. We need some more investment in healthcare. We need some more investment in education. We need investment in areas where actually the public sector, and this goes obviously to the tax question, actually often provides some of the demand, okay? But yes, the demographics were a very important part of thinking this through. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me that we are in a bit of a, um, there's a bit of a tension in our, for, for us as, as an entity, because on the one hand, we want to be able to participate in some of the trends that are going to be generating uh, returns over the next decade uh, plus. But on the other hand, we also are concerned about the longer term value creation Im implications and um, em you know, employment, particularly in a country like the United States where um, consumption drives so much of the economy. If more and more workers are in lower income, but worse livelihood jobs, mm -hmm. uh, what are the long term implications for um, the economy and ultimately the, the markets as a result of that? And so. Uh, can can you uh, how how do we how do we crosswalk that? Obviously, policy public policy is a key um, input here because we can't solve all of the big macro questions on our own. But at the individual investment decision um, level, we, you know, which is where we you know we, we have strategies, but we also have individual investment decisions that we make. So how do we how do we crosswalk all of that, or can we? Well, I think that uh, it's, it's a great question, and I think uh, I've thought about that, um, and I've looked a bit back at history. Um, there are 
economists out there that feel that uh, the worker is going to adjust. Uh, we always have. Uh, there are those that have looked back historically and have seen the disruption of the printing press uh, and uh, those that say in 1900, uh, in the 1900s, 40% uh, of the workforce was in agriculture. Today it's 2% and the workers adjusted. Um, so there is a philosophy out there that we need to be very patient and yet pay attention to the demographics, pay attention to sustainability and governance. Uh, be more engaged with society, and hence this idea of Larry Fink's and others that we, we ought to take a broader view, to give us this adjustment that will come, that we're going to free up uh, human time, and we are going to be more creative, quite frankly, and that the jobs are going to be more interesting, more sustainable, uh, and, and, and per even perhaps more healthful. There is that viewpoint out there. I think the scary thing uh, is that uh, never before in history have we seen such acceleration of change. There's the problem. Uh, we had time during the Industrial Revolution to kind of figure it out. But this is going very, very fast. And our institutions and constituencies are having a tough time catching up. And that's the anxiety that I think we're dealing with. So I, I do think we have to stay in tuned and patient. And I think that uh, we have to invest with a longer trajectory in mind because we don't quite know where it's all going. Does that make sense to you? I mean, that's a viewpoint that I think many have expressed. There. So I, I think that, yes, I, I, it makes sense. I think that. Um, as, as I said, I, I, I'm not concerned that society doesn't create the jobs. I actually am concerned about the quality of jobs, and I include by quality uh, the basically the livelihoods of jobs. And I will say that actually most of the studies now, I just saw a presentation, a very important writer on this topic is a guy named David Otor at MIT. And he just did this big database thing with, uh, with um, looking at 34 OECD countries. So what he concluded was that the technology, so he's looking back, he's looking on automation for the last you know, 30 years or something like that. And he says, okay, it actually, on net, it does create jobs. It does. So again, so it's destroying some, it's creating new ones, the, uh, the, and uh, there's disruption in the middle. Um, but he also says, but what it also does, it actually reduces the labor share of income. So basically what happened is that workers move into these new jobs, the, the distribution of the income generated by those new jobs goes more to the owners of capital, the investors, than it does to the workers. So the labor share of national income declines, okay? And that's, and that's reflecting the, the wage pressure, okay? Um, the McKinsey Global Institute study and James Menenka, who was sort of headed this study and be the first to confess, they do everything here except sort of the wage effect. Because it's really, really hard to do. Uh, all you can do is really look and say, where are the jobs likely to be? Where are they likely to disappear? Here's the difference in wages and skills. So I can see that that distribution is going to look like it's going to really hit low skill, low income workers, and it's going to, it's sort of monotonic. If you're at the top, you're, you're complimented, and then it goes down. Um, so I think that might be different than the past industrial revolutions in addition to the speed. So I think we may be handling something different here. So then the question becomes, all right, maybe we're going to look at a world in which some of the returns to capital are shared with the workers. So why, you know, you said it's only 1980 that we had this. There are other mechanisms, and that's what I think the, the representation of unions say on the, the boards in Germany may be getting at, okay? All right, so this, this surplus created by this wonderful machinery, these intelligent machines, uh, and how do we distribute the income from that so it doesn't all go to the owners of the machine? I think that, that's a very big kind of issue I would put out there. Um, so for when you're thinking about investment right now, of course, where you're investing in a company where you have highly skilled workers who are basically 
going to be needed to either develop the technology, maintain the technology, work with the technology, that's a, that's a win, okay, that, that's a win. Uh, where you're dealing with a company where you think a significant amount of that labor force is actually going to be made redundant, you just, you just know that. And then that's a decision you can make at the, vo at the point of view of the company. You can think about the social or policy interventions around that, but the company itself will do that and, that, and that will make sense for the company. Okay, well thank you so much. On that note, I'm going to have to bring this session to a close. We do have two members of the public who wish to speak. Um, but before I bring them up, I just wanted to thank you all oh, for a very thought-provoking session, and we really appreciate the time that you've taken out of your busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I would now invite to the uh, microphone Susan Weber and Jason Perez. You will each have three minutes uh, to speak. Thanks so much. I'm Susan Weber. I'm the publisher of the website Naked Capitalism. Um, one of the things that I think makes um, presentations or considering issues like this complex for CalPERS is that projecting out trends tends to work for investors very well on a short or even medium term basis, but on a long term basis it can be a bit more thorny. And when you're talking about trends as big as globalization and trends like uh, increasing income inequality, which you know the panelists acknowledged was one of the big you know side effects of of ri the rise in technology. Those historically have generated their own sort of self-limiting. Um, they turned out to be self-limiting. The great period of the, we had a historically tr tremendous period of globalization right before World War One, and World War One and the collapse of the gold standard led to a dramatic reduction in, in international trade flows. We didn't get back to anywhere near that level until well after World War II. Um, similarly, high levels of globalization are associated with high levels of global capital mobility. And uh, uh, Ken, Rogo Ken um, Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt determined in their study of 800 years of financial crises that high levels of international capital flows are strongly correlated with more frequent and more severe financial crises. So again, this seemingly positive trend of globalization, in fact, has its own self-limiting factor that it generates more and more catastrophic financial crises. On the income inequality front, you know, we've, the first uh, two, there's now the best academic research, says the first two generations after the Industrial Revolution saw declining average worker wages. Um, there was a real reduction in, in living standards for ordinary people. What came out of that was a series of revolutions across Europe in 1848. Okay. Now, they didn't turn over any governments, but there's a widespread, there, the, again, a lot of historians argue that there was some amelioration of, of capitalism then. Out of that also came Engels and Marx, and their philosophies have had very long-standing influence. Um, one of the things that's happening now is the stagnant, there's also a lot of research that says that stagnant worker in incomes tend to lead to people to vote in more right-wing governments. So what we've seen in the U.S., what we've seen in Germany, Italy, you know, those are no, the rise of, the rise of nationalistic governments, which are hostile to trade, is also correlated with stagnant worker income. So basically, if the private sector doesn't figure this out, it's going to be interrupted by, you know, by external factors that are going to start to check this. Thank you. Mr. Perez? Jason Perez, Corona Police Officers Association, CalPERS member. Uh, I understand, uh, I agree with uh, President Mather that there seems to be some kind of disconnect or um, uneasiness within the organization, but there sh really shouldn't be. It's pretty clear in the California Constitution and again in your mission statement that uh, your job as the board and CalPERS at large is to uh, make the maximum amount of return on investment to care for its members. So while this is uh, an, in an informative um, two hours, uh, and you say that it's, you're just uh, letting us know of the trend, sir. Uh, it's very dangerous to mention twice that uh, we need to step away from, or the trend is to step away from focusing on earning returns and, and looking at ESGs. And y you can say it's just, um, it's just informational, um, but your trade lets you learn how to speak with some influence and there's definitely a flavor into this, to these last two hours. You're, you're, you're leading the board. 
Thank you. Thank you. So with that, uh, Mr. Sensini, did you have any final comments and conclusion, or should we uh, move to the break? We go to the break. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. But, uh, so we are going to now. Yeah, move. I actually. Oh, sorry, Ms. Tyson. I, I actually do have a response yes. to that because I think it, what I, I I would like to say that um, what I was I, I would like to emphasize that there are a lot of technical experts out there, including uh, I refer to and I'll refer to once again the SASB board, who are interested not in. Uh, trading off one kind of return versus another kind of return, and that's not what Larry Fink is interested in either. Larry Fink is saying that, whether you, whether you agree with him or not, what he's saying is, in order to have a long-term perspective as an investor on a company, you need to look at their sustainability performance, because sustainability, by definition, means the foundation of their long-term performance. So. I think that those, there are many investors who are paying attention to ESG, not because they want a return uh, that's in some kind of non-monetary return that they would sacrifice the monetary return for. That's not why they're interested. What they're interested in is the risk to their monetary returns if they don't take ESG factors into account if the company they're investing in doesn't take ESG factors into account, that that's a risk to their monetary return. So right. a lot of investors think that way. Yes, I, I, I guess I want to speak to that too, uh, just to be clear, because it's a, an important point. Um, uh, this really has to be about return on investment. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do not mean to imply that the trends are going the other way at all. What I meant to say is that as you look at these disruptive technologies, you, you, you see longer-term business models, and many believe uh, that ESG kinds of principles and governance correlate ultimately to better shareholder returns and returns on investment. So uh, clearly, uh, I want to make it very clear that that, that is uh, the nature of fiduciary obligation today and the nature of investing. It's just to point out uh, that these ESG principles are finding their way more into the dialogue because of the disruption and competition going on that we tried to lay out. So I think we're very correlated on that. So if you don't thank have you. to prioritize thank you. the I'm two. sorry, we cannot have a back and forth. I'm sorry, Mr. Perez. Uh, thank you. So that brings us to the conclusion of this session. And uh, we will take a 15-minute break now and um, uh, re restart with a next session on core economy at around 11.35. Core economy. You're